Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is uh, the third talk in this season of the Chris Speaker series. Uh, today is our pleasure to have Dr. Patrick Ball. I've known uh, Patrick for nigh on 15 years now. Um, Dr. Patrick Ball is, uh, has been doing a lot of work in the area of human rights. Um, he uh, testified against Slobodan, Slobodan Milosevic mm -hmm. at uh, the International Criminal Court. Um, he's the winner of the ACM Eugene Lawler Award as well as the Electronic Frontier Foundation Pioneer Award. And today he's going to talk to us about production and consumption of human rights data and how computer science can save people's lives. After this talk, um, Patrick will be meeting with students in room 1331 of this building and all students are welcome to join him there. So let's welcome Patrick. Thanks. I commented to Ian as we were getting started that I've lectured in universities all around the world, including several others in Canada, and I think this is the single most punctual crowd that I have ever, uh, I have ever spoken to. Um, I hope that you will then have very punctual questions at the end, challenging and punctual. I want to talk to you today primarily about epistemology, about what it means to know something. Because I think, of course, this is the foundation of everything else we do, whether it's in history, in political science, in peace and studies, peace and justice uh, approaches, in the law, or in computer science, in our effort to represent human knowledge in, with, with technology. At, at the root, we have to ask, what is it that we know or are trying to know? And in what sense is that knowledge then codified in the various kinds of code that we use to project it? I'm going to be speaking largely with negative examples of things, of situations in which we thought we knew something. We went to enormous effort to know something, something of terrific social import. And now I'm not sure that we knew what we thought we knew. In fact, I'm going to show a number of examples in which we clearly and obviously did not know what we thought we knew and how disturbing this is. I'll then suggest that this situation is actually getting much, much worse not better, it's getting much worse. As technology produces more data, we have become increasingly naive about what that data means, and I think that's a really giant problem. Um, rather than solving that problem, which I could do, but that would be a different talk, I'm going to talk about what technology can do to help us with things we can actually know. And this is part of where that question of epistemology comes in. I'll suggest that Fundamentally, what I think computers can do best for the human rights movement is to help enable human judgment, that is to enable subjective claims about what is true, rather than aggregating data and presenting falsely objective claims, which I will argue are uh, fundamentally misleading. This work comes from uh, about 21 years in the field. Uh, I've advised nine official truth commissions. I've worked with three international criminal tribunals a number of UN missions, and dozens and dozens of non-governmental human rights organizations in over 30 countries. And there's a bunch of things that I've learned there. Fundamentally, I've learned that the human rights movement works by listening to people. We absorb the experiences of people who've suffered. We often call this witness. We call it the experience that people have transmitted to others. We transform uh, suffering into testimony. And the point of witness, the reason we're doing this, is to figure out what that person is saying. What, what have they experienced? Who are they? What did they go through? And from that, we build analysis and advocacy. But the trick here is that analysis and advocacy based on witness requires context and judgment. We have to know what happened in this place before the stories that this person tells us. What is the history of this place? Who are the actors? Who are the various parties trying to do harm? Who is trying to do good? Is there good to be done? What is to be accomplished? Who are the ethnicities? Is there a, a gender component? What are these pieces? And all of that is required to do analysis. Our claim about the analysis being valid is grounded in this judgment. It's grounded in the context and history that we bring to a subjective claim. Statistics are completely different. Statistics do not rest on context. The validity of statistics rests on sampling and modeling. It does not rest on the statistics coming from big data. 
Okay? So I want to just start off from the beginning talking about a little bit about the notion of what do we mean when we do statistics. I'll do this and try to do this in 30 seconds. Statistics means two things. First, literally, statistics origin means knowledge about the state. Uh, that's what the word comes from, is how do we understand the activities of an entire government. Uh, but what we mean by statistics now more formally in mathematical statistics in the, in the modern world is that a statistic is some sort of measure that we calculate by looking at data. The data come from a sample, some sample of things we have observed about the world. So the statistic comes from the sample. And the statistic, by the way, only speaks to the sample. It does not speak about the world. In order to go from what we can observe, the sample, to the world, requires some sort of model. It requires us a model that allows us to make what statisticians call an inference, which is a projection from the sample to the universe. And I want to flag that because there's two things that we need to keep in mind as we go through the rather sad examples that I'm going to present. One is that in order to go from what we observe to what we believe to be true in the world, we need to have a model. And that model will have embedded in it assumptions about how the sample was drawn, about how the probabilities work such that the sample tells us about the universe, as well as a whole lot of mathematics that help us make the bridge. The model also enables us to calculate the variance or the error, or the margin of error, sometimes lay people call it, around the estimates we make about the population. If we don't have that, we don't have valid statistics, period, full stop. Okay? If we can't calculate error, we don't have valid statistics. Now, there's one exception to that, which people always come back to, and that's if you know everything. If your sample is the universe, and there are some business processes in which that's true, but it's almost never true in social situations, and I argue it is never true in human rights. So statistics, the validity of statistics, does not rest on context and judgment. It rests on methodology, modeling, sampling. It rests on math. That's really different. Really, really different. Those are two fundamentally different ways to understand the world. I argue complementary ways, but very, very different. Technology can help us do both. So let's move forward and talk about what human rights does. Okay? So what human rights does, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Now, we may be trying to do that contemporaneously. We may be asking, how many people have been killed in Syria since March 2011? That's a really important question. It's a very hard question. Um, we may be asking, what's happened in the past in order to, ask some, to pose some sort of hypothesis? We may be asking, was it plausible that the killing and migration that happened between March and June 1999 in Kosovo was the result of NATO's airstrikes? Or is it plausible that that killing and migration was the result of KLA guerrilla activity? Or is it plausible that that was the result of Yugoslav paramilitary groups? So we may have a different kinds of questions, contemporaneous or retrospective. To accomplish this, we receive reports from witnesses and victims. We do the witness thing, right? We talk to people. We listen to them. We elicit their experiences. We may investigate specific cases. We'll, of course, maintain records, often in computer databases. We may gather forensic information or remote sensing information from satellites. We'll draw conclusions about conditions. We'll say, hey, you know what? Things are getting, getting better. Violence is going down. Or, oh dear, things are getting worse. We have a problem. We may make comparisons across regions compare the north and the south, the east and the west, and so forth. We will make claims about variable perpetrator responsibility. We'll say, well, you know, we think it's group A that's doing most of the violence. Or, no, 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 it's, it's group B. We'll want to make those sorts of comparisons. And in the best cases, in the cases that result in justice, we will want the findings we make to have enough rigor that they can be used as evidence in war crimes trials. But it's hard. Statistics are hard to do, and it's very easy to mislead. It's easy to mislead your readers, but more problematically and more dangerously, it's easy to mislead yourself. Sometimes people think that getting enough data leads to statistical validity. Well, look, that's, that's a room full of paper, OK? And my colleagues and I, a much younger me, uh, spent a very long time collecting that paper. That paper includes records of the deaths of over 37,000 people in Guatemala, as well as the personal testimonies of over 6,000 people. Uh, and summaries of newspaper reports of violent deaths that were collected from every single newspaper published in Guatemala between 1960 and 1996. We had teams of students read every single newspaper that was published in that period. There were 13 of them. 
that were published for the part or whole of that period. Uh, and there's a, a law in Guatemala that if you publish a newspaper, you're welcome to publish anything you like, although maybe we'll murder your journalists. But we can publish anything you like as long as you give a copy of the newspaper to the National Library, to the Emoroteca Nacional. And so we were able to go to the Emoroteca and read them all and create summaries of them. We created a wall full of paper. We created a giant database, 65 megabytes. If any of you can imagine the immensity of 65 megabytes of data, which is immense if you're working with uh, laptops that have 20 megabyte hard drives and are running 386 chips with DOS on monochrome screens with two megabytes of RAM, okay? So part of the reason I say this is it doesn't take high tech to do this stuff, but with all that work, which I wrote a book about, by the way, I don't think we got it right, and my first example is gonna come out of that work. The reason that the statistical patterns derived from massive data are not true is because statistical results are a function of the capacity that we have to capture information. S the statistics from observed data are about the process of observation. They are not necessarily about what's happening on the ground because observation requires a certain kind of visibility. We have to be able to observe. And there's a whole series of problems with observation that I'm going to flag as we go by here as I head toward the examples. So unless we collect information from a randomly, se randomly selected group of respondents, which is very, very rare, uh, but does happen sometimes, or unless we model the probability of reporting, which is also rare but, but doable in some narrow circumstances with a few assumptions, witness alone does not provide a statistically reliable measure of the true patterns and magnitude of violence. So by witness, let's kind of review a little bit about what we're talking about here. Everything from testimonies given to truth commissions, UN investigations, press articles, crowdsourcing, which is very popular right now, it's the same as all the rest, NGO reporting, whether we're talking about big NGOs like Human Rights Watch or little local NGOs, social media feeds, perpetrator records, even government registries, these are all partial records. And their partiality leads them to necessarily be statistically biased. I do not mean politically biased. I'm not accusing anybody of having an agenda here. Rather, I'm saying that the process of social visibility make some things available to these, social, these collection mechanisms and other things stay hidden. The story we often tell in our team is that every time a lawyer is killed at high noon in, the, in an urban center, the world hears about it. But when rural peasants are killed way off a road in the middle of the night, we rarely hear about it. That's a very extreme case of the differences in social visibility between two events that from a statistical point of view are the same, they're homicides. But we saw one and we didn't see the other one. And when you aggregate tons of seeing one and not seeing the other one, your process of observation becomes greatly distorted. Let's give an example. Let's imagine we have three databases, you know, like the project I just showed from Guatemala where we had press articles and we had other NGOs reports, which we all coded and put together, and we had in a third database individual interviews that we took from people. And we put all those data into a single database. We identified the duplicates, which by the way is a really terrific computer science problem. Uh, database hardening, database deduplication, duplicate detection, super interesting data mining problem. Um, let's assume we put all those data into one database, and I'm here representing that by the union of these three circles, the three white circles. And that indicates what we can see. Hmm, what can we not see? What's hidden from our process? So the question we ask is, does the world look like this, where we see about a third of it, or does the world look like this, where we see all of it? We don't know. As long as we're inside those white circles, and unless we do a lot of fancy statistical modeling, we can't tell the difference between those two. The problem is that different strata in the world, different segments of violence in the world will be in different kinds of circles. So in Peru, uh, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission looked at uh, killings reported to the commission and to a number of other sources, and then we did the modeling that I discussed earlier, which if anybody asks, I'll show it how it's done at the end. Uh, seventh grade algebra is required, but I imagine people can follow that. Um, when we looked at those killings, we discovered that the killings attributed to the Maoist guerrillas of the Sendero Luminosa, the Shining Path, only about half of what the models told us had happened was reported. But when we looked at killings attributed to the Peruvian army, uh, nearly all of the killings attributed to the Peruvian army appeared in our data systems. So we were able to say, hang on, we have the story about the Peruvian army. 
but we really don't have the story about the Sendero Luminoso. Now, let's take a step back. What if we had not done the modeling? What if we had only looked at what's in the white circles? Well, we would have falsely concluded that the amount of killing committed by the, the Sendero Luminoso is approximately the same as that committed by the Peruvian army. We would have fallen into the trap of false moral equivalence simply because our data capture mechanism was only able to capture about the same amount of data from each party. A lot of the data about Sendero Luminoso's killings remained hidden. And there's a stack, a giant stack of social reasons and political reasons why that would be the case. Uh, that's a big problem, folks. That's a big problem. That affects how we understand killings in Iraq under the coalition's occupation. I'd be happy to talk about that in the Q&A. It affects how we understand deaths in the uh, earthquake in Haiti. It affects how we understand just about every situation of mass violence that I have studied in the last 20 years. So why does this happen? And then I'm going to go into some examples of how bad it is. Right. Please. Okay. Right. Through estimating the total using a technique called multiple systems estimation. And I'm going to flag that. I'll pick it up in the Q&A if there's questions. Uh, that's the other way this talk might have gone, but Ian asked me to go in the technology direction rather than the modeling direction. So I'm going to talk about technology instead of modeling, but we can go back to modeling uh, in the Q&A. Sir? Right. The question is, how do you know what the gray area is, basically? How do you know how big the total is? And I answered through modeling uh, and creating a probability model and making an estimate. And I'll be happy to go into that estimation technique at, in the Q&A. So here's why it happens. Here's what we've deduced over many years. These are specific to human rights data collection, but you can easily project them to almost any other form of social data collection which does not draw its, its information randomly from the affected population. One thing, the thing that we found most kind of high impact in this stuff is that as a monitoring organization changes its focus or changes its resources, the statistics it, pr it produces changes. So I spent a lot of time working in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2010 and uh, 2011. And so I focused a lot on the UN's field offices that were tracking information about the Lord's Resistance Army and the violence committed by the LRA. So we'll go to the little office in Dungu, which is in northeastern Congo and is the kind of point office for the monitoring of LRA violence. And the people that I knew who worked in that office were really, really committed uh, human rights monitors. Uh, and there were six people who worked in that office, and they worked super hard. So let's imagine that in March, they document 100 cases. They work really, really hard, and they document 100 cases. Now, these folks are really committed, but this is still the UN. So in April, half of them go on leave. OK, that's what happens at the UN. People go on leave a lot. So people go on leave, and in April, with half of them on leave, they document 40 cases. Mm -hmm. Now, you send that database record to Kinshasa and then to New York. And by the time you get to New York, New York is like, woohoo, LRA violence is on the decline. You're all laughing. Then the Security Council makes a finding like that. Okay? That's how severe this is, is that we have giant policy bodies making decisions that are determined by how many people are on leave. Okay? Because nobody thinks about the linkage between a database and how it got produced. Okay? So this happens all the time. Uh, similarly, any other change in the capacity of the monitoring group on the ground will determine the statistics. So if you send somebody out there who speaks Acholi or Lingala or, uh, or, or Kinrwanda, one of the other local languages in that region, you'll get a lot more reporting because local people can interact with you directly. If everyone in the office only speaks French, you'll get a lot less reporting because you'll only be able to talk to people, uh, local Congolese people who've had high school educations and speak French. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that happen. Similarly, if a rumor goes around that UN staff are uh, molesting children, and these rumors go around fairly regularly, the local population will become very concerned and, reasonably enough, withdraw from contact with the UN monitors. Consequently, reporting will go down. From the point of view of Kinshasa or New York, it will seem as though LRA violence is declining. That's not what's happening at all. What's happening is that you're getting less rela relationship with the local population. And this is the one that I've, I've done a lot of thinking about. The incentives available to victims to report change over time. So the classic case here, again staying in Congo, is the transformation in the world's attention to sexual violence. 
Sexual violence and conflict is age old. It has been happening since there has been conflict among people. But very recently, we've started paying very close attention to it. This is all to the good. So one of the ways that the world pays attention to sexual violence and conflict is by providing incentives to victims to receive treatment of different kinds. So the world's governments have provided a lot of resources to NGOs, Congolese and international NGOs, to provide medical treatment to the survivors of sexual violence, psychological treatment, vocational treatment, social reintegration, and so forth. And as happens in any complex ecosystem, an abundance of resources creates diversification, so there's now a whole lot of NGOs competing to provide services to, to the victim population. So what does a rational victim do? Well. She goes and gets medical treatment here, psychological treatment here, social reintegration services here, and so forth. She goes to all of them. So far, so good. I, have, I think this is all great. Except one of the ways the UN monitors sexual violence is by counting the number of cases that are reported to NGOs. But how many cases are reported five times? Okay. A lot of them. And because of confidentiality requirements, which are entirely appropriate, the NGOs have no way to deduplicate their cases. So we multiply count lots and lots of cases. So the estimate of cases is much too high, except it's also much too low, because most victims don't come to any NGO or report anything. So what do we do? What do we call a number that's both much too high and much too low? Ah, it's meaningless. And unfortunately, as the ecosystem of NGOs changes, the number of cases will go up and down like this. And as a consequence, our ability to measure sexual violence in the Congo is essentially nil. No, we, we, really, we, don't, we, don't, we don't really have any idea. But we can delude ourselves by looking at a graph. And I will uh, come back to that later in this, in this talk. There have been two epidemiological studies in Congo, which I think um, are very, very good, which do draw random, selection, random uh, samples. Uh, but they, they have other issues that are very, very, very complex issues. But they've gotten a lot closer. I am not criticizing those. I want to distinguish the epidemiological surveys from the, um, from the case counting. So we'll go back to Guatemala, because my criticisms in this talk, I want to start with criticizing work that I've done, work that I've published, because I was, I mean, I was fundamental in starting the database revolution in human rights, and now I'm, I want to also be the one criticizing where we went with it. And so we go to Guatemala and we say, okay, let's look at those three sources. You remember I told you about that we had reports to other NGOs, we had the interviews taken by the NGO that I was working with, the International Center for Human Rights Research, and we have press, press data. And I've separated those three and graphed the number of violent deaths, killings, that were reported in each of those sources by year. So there's time across the horizontal axis and quantity on the vertical axis. And as we see, the documentary and interview sources go along here at very, very low numbers through the 70s. And then late 80s, excuse me, late 70s, early 80s, they go up to a peak during a period that the Official Truth Commission, the Commission for Historical Clarification of the United Nations, uh, declared that acts of genocide were committed by the Guatemalan army against the Mayan people. This is that period. And then they go down to lower levels. The press goes along, finding actually more cases than the other two in the 70s, but then during the genocide, goes to almost zero and stays at a very low level. The press completely missed the story. The genocide happened in Guatemala. Why would that happen? Well, some of the people killed back there in the 70s were journalists. And the other journalists got the message right away. Don't cover this stuff. Another reason is that, like in most countries, the newspapers in Guatemala are very urban focused. And the genocide did not happen in urban areas. By the early 1980s, killings in the urban areas had, had gone way down. Another reason is that in Guatemala, the newspapers are very focused on Spanish speakers. And the genocide did not largely happen to people who speak Spanish. It happened to spoke people who speak indigenous languages. So for all of these reasons and many more combining, the press didn't cover it. Now, I'm not really criticizing the press in Guatemala. I kind of understand why they made the decisions they did. I don't necessarily agree with them, but I can imagine rational people coming to those conclusions. But let me put up a big flag for people who think that massive amounts of data mining on press sources today will lead to anything like a statistically valid picture of violence in the world. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. You're going to get really big blind spots. You may get spots where the press does a pretty good job. But when things get really bad, you're likely to have some giant blind spots. And those blind spots will profoundly distort your analysis. Again, I'll come back to Iraq if there are, story, if there are questions in the Q&A. Let's go to Kosovo, another of the projects I worked on. There, there were uh, three big 
projects that nearly contemporaneously with the conflict between March and June of 1999 and then stretching to the later part of 1999, conducted interviews with uh, many Kosovar people, all uh, both in, I mean, in Macedonia and Albania and Bosnia, as well as inside of Kosovo after the violence uh, ended in, in June. Well, after the first round of violence ended, it started up again in December. Um, and that includes Human Rights Watch, the American Bar Association, and their many Albanian partners, and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of interviews were conducted by these groups. And I, I got copies of those, and my colleagues and I went through and extracted the reports of the violent deaths in all of them, and then classified them by region, among other things. And if we just look at them by region, we can say, well, wow, Human Rights Watch found that 4% of the deaths occurred in the East. The American Bar Association found that about a third of the deaths occurred in the East. And the OSCE found that almost half of the deaths occurred in the East. Now, keep in mind that in Kosovo, a key question is what was the geographic pattern of violence? Because that's tied intimately to our determination about who the perpetrators could have been. Well, how much happened in the East? Anyone care to guess? Is it between four, or th four and 46 percent? It's got to be in between those two extremes, right? No. <laughs> no, it, it, it could be lower or higher than that. These graphs tell us almost nothing about violence in Kosovo. They tell us a great deal about where each of those projects focused their attention. Okay? It's clear that Human Rights Watch was not interested in the East. And indeed, if you ask Human Rights, Research, Human Rights Watch researchers now, they'll be like, oh yeah, that wasn't where we focused. We were really focused on specific investigations in other places. They don't find this a critique, which I agree. It's not a critique of Human Rights Watch. That's not what Human Rights Watch does. It is a critique of people who would take qualitative approaches and try to transform them directly through counting into statistical indicators. It is a critique of that. Now, there's a way to go from this data to a valid statistical model. Again, Q&A. But counting is not the way to do it. Okay, counting leads us to this muddle where we can't tell what the truth is. Similarly in Sierra Leone, where the Truth and Reconciliation Commission conducted thousands upon thousands of interviews, so did the Campaign for Good Governance, a really, really terrific first-rate NGO. Um, and one of the questions they asked is, of the victims of violent killing, of, of violent death, killings, what linguistic group did they belong to? Did they belong to the Mende group or to the Temne group? Okay. And the Truth Commission finds that more than half of the victims belong to the Mende group. The Campaign for Good Governance finds that the plurality belong to the Temne group. Oh dear, which is true. So let's go on, Whew. put that aside for a second and say, hang on, why are we doing statistics? And what's the point here? The point is comparison, okay? It's nice to have an estimate of magnitude and that, that's often what the press want. They wanna know what's the big number, what's the headline? Yeah, okay, sure. But the point of statistics is to compare categories to understand patterns. So to understand a pattern, we actually need an unbiased estimate of every single piece that we're comparing. So if we go back to the example I gave from the, from the Congo, where we were trying to compare March and April to get a, a trend over time, we need an estimate for March and an estimate for April. Okay? If we go to one of the other uh, examples, such as the comparison in Sierra Leone between linguistic groups, we need, a comparison, we need an estimate for the Temne and an estimate for the Mende. And they have to be unbiased. Because any bias that's in any one of those categories will create a distortion in our analysis. Indeed, it does not create noise or imprecision, which is sometimes the, 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 the rebuttal to the position I'm suggesting. Uh, people say, well, you know, I, I know it's not perfect. Yeah, it's backwards. It's not just imperfect, it's inverted when, di when, when distortions enter this. And believe me, when you do more complicated analytic models, it gets worse because you just hide more deeply the, com the, the, the structure of bias. And you end up with a regression coefficient. You have no idea what that thing means. And I want to flag here that pretty much anything that we do that's an aggregated analysis has this implicit statistical assumption of unbiased categories inside it. And I want to explicitly include maps and data visualizations here. Sometimes people think that because they're drawing pictures of variably sized people, stick figures, that they're not doing statistics. They're making a graph. A map that has some big dots on it and some little dots on it is a graph. 
in which we are explicitly comparing the magnitude of the different sizes of dots. What if one of those dots is coming from a place where nobody can get a message out? It'll be a little tiny dot. It'll seem like there's no violence there. We have no idea. We may fundamentally misunderstand the, the situation. Now, I'm going to close, and I'm not, I'm, I don't want to go into this, because I want to zoom into other kinds of analysis. But I, do not, I am not saying that statistics are impossible. They're not impossible at all. It's just that counting doesn't get you the, there. Okay? You can, if you had perfect statistics, as I say, you know, if you run an ISP, in theory, you can know every single packet that passes through your ISP. And you can do any statistics you like on that perfect data. If you're a company making widgets and you're shipping widgets, you could remember, if you have adequate bookkeeping, every location you shipped a widget to. And you can do any statistics you like there. Because in those cases, your sample is the same as the population. Those are sometimes called uh, complete administrative statistics or a census. Formally, they are a census. Now, you could also do a probability sample of some sort of the whole population. Now, that may be difficult if the population of interest is people who have been killed. Because in my experience, it is very difficult to interview people who have been killed. However, um, you can interview survivors and create a probability model that any given death leaves a certain number of survivors. And so there's a way to model that problem, and you could figure it out. Or you can do statistical projection from databases using multiple systems estimation. Or there are now several other families of model modeling techniques that allow you to uh, to assess or at least make rigorous assumptions or, or transparent assumptions about how the structure of bias works. But I want to flag here that, again, and then I'm going to close this section, statistical accuracy comes from sampling and modeling. It does not come from big data. Big data is not enough. Um, so I'm going to start giving some examples that I think are happy examples. And the first example that I want to talk about is what if what we're talking about is a, a, a fixed and knowable domain, albeit a very large one? So one example is the uh, Guatemala National Police Archives. These archives include all the paper that survived, that's a key limitation, all the paper that survived from the archives of the National Police that existed from the late 19th century until 1996. They were disbanded as part of the peace process because Many people in Guatemala quite rightly believed that the National Police had committed tens of thousands of disappearances. So they thought, hmm, this is not the police we want. So uh, the National Police were disbanded, the National Civilian Police were created in their stead, and these archives were abandoned. Now, the existence of the archives had been denied for many years. But in 2005, they were discovered. Uh, and one of the questions that the people who discovered and worked on the archives had is, what did these archives say? What's here? How can we get an understanding of what's in the entire archive? And when I was invited to talk to them about it, I said, let's take a sample. So we developed a sampling technique in which we mapped the topology of the shape of all these dumped documents, piles and piles and piles of documents in sacks. We developed a structure, a, a map of that, a digital map of that, and then chose points in space at random through that, uh, through that topology. And from that, uh, random sample of about 15,000 documents. We analyzed, among several other variables, the flow pattern. Who originated the document? Who did they send it to? Who was copied? Since these were physical documents, that was a big deal. Okay? It was a big deal who gets to see documents, because they were typed on manual typewriters with carbon paper, like literal carbon paper. Amazing, I know, hard to imagine, uh, really. But the structure of these documents gives us some hints about how the bureaucracy functioned. It tells us who created plans, who operationalized the plans into orders, who executed the orders, and then who wrote reports saying, I did what you told me to do, and here's the outcome. That's how bureaucracies function. And if you want to run a big bureaucracy that uses violence as its primary mechanism, you need a lot of bureaucracy as it hands. You need a lot of paperwork. Because people who commit a lot of violence have a constant temptation to use that violence for personal gain. And if you're trying to commit state terror, you don't want them to become corrupt. You want them to stay violent. So you need them to write accurate reports describing the violence that they've committed in order to assure that they've done the job that you've set them to do. That may seem completely insane, but it's actually even harder to control a bureaucracy committing violence than it is to control a bureaucracy that's producing widgets. And 
So they, in the business of state terror, have adopted these the same techniques that business people invented. Um, and we found these kinds of archives in many places. So what we found in Guatemala was especially interesting because it bears on the case of this man, Hector Bol de la Cruz. Now, excuse me, not, that, that's not Hector Bol de la Cruz. Bol de la Cruz is the man who uh, was in charge of the police when he was disappeared. That's Edgar Fernando Garcia. Uh, Garcia, Mr. Garcia was a student and labor leader uh, in the early 1980s. And in February of 1984, he left his home and, excuse me, left his office and did not make it home. He never turned up at home. And his wife, uh, Nineth Montenegro de Garcia, mounted an enormous campaign in which Amnesty played a huge role looking for Mr. Garcia. They uh, flooded the Guatemalan uh, police system with demands for his whereabouts, for knowledge of his whereabouts, uh, as well as all sorts of legal procedures uh, trying to force the police to admit that they had arrested him. The police steadfastly denied for decades that they had arrested him. However, uh, in 2006, documents inside the archive turned up showing that indeed the police had arrested Mr. Garcia. They had executed him and hidden his body. Uh, now, one of the defense of the two men who were accused of having committed the disappearance, one of their defenses was that they were following orders. Right? I mean, this is what low-level perpetrators say, and indeed, they're probably right. <laughs> I mean, this is not an inaccurate defense, it's just in an, an inadequate one. So the judge said, okay, you were following orders. And they turned to the prosecutors and said, could you please investigate the commanders who gave these orders? I'd like to see them in front of the, you know, up next. Well, Mr. Bol de la Cruz, Colonel Bol de la Cruz, was the director of the National Police uh, when Mr. Garcia was disappeared, and uh, Mr. Bol de la Cruz was arrested uh, in June of 2010. Excuse me, 2011, sorry. Um, and has been charged with the disappearance of uh, Mr. Garcia. So one of the questions, one of the defenses, excuse me, that was raised by uh, Mr. Bol de la Cruz in his first court appearance is, well, you know, the uh, police was full of rogue agents. I, I don't know what those guys did on the ground. You know, this is the flip side of I was following orders, right? The guys on the ground say I was following orders. The guys at the top say I wasn't giving orders. I don't know what they were doing. So one of the questions we can ask is, well, in the context of Mr. Garcia's disappearance, what was the police doing intellectually, informationally, in data terms, what were they doing? Were they following the procedures that a normal bureaucracy would, 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 would follow, where there are plans and, and big picture ideas that are operationalized into orders and that reports are written indicating the orders have been fulfilled? Well, we analyzed from the sample that flow and find that indeed there is a very regular flow of those things. So indeed the bureaucracy was functioning normally. This does not exclude the possibility that in this specific case there were uh, these, that the two uh, officers involved in the disappearance were rogue agents. We cannot exclude that. But we can say that in a general sense, the uh, bureaucracy was functioning normally. And we have submitted an expert report in the case to this effect. So I flag this just to kind of give us a sense of, of our introduction to um, what we mean by systems that enable human judgment. Okay? They're generally non-quantitative, although the example I've given is quantitative. I'll give you another example in a moment that's fully non-quantitative. But they're very context-specific. Often in technology, we're looking for a tool that transforms millions of people, right? This is the sort of the conceit that drives the TED process, right? We're looking for something that changes the whole world. Well, I mean, and that, those are often transformative. They're wonderful. But it turns out that in most actual human rights work, we would be far better served to think of a tool that serves this problem that is context-specific and purpose-built. And that in particular helps the analysts involved focus on answerable questions of fact that are central to the debate. Okay? And these are often questions of existence rather than a question of pattern. And I'll talk for a moment in, in a moment about what I mean by that. We want to organize information in a way that enables discussion and judgment. And we should resist the urge to generalize our tool to every other human rights organization in the whole world. Because as it happens, what the UN does is completely different from what small NGOs do. And they're both completely different from what international NGOs do. And they're both completely different from what war crimes tribunals do, et cetera. Okay. So I'm going to turn now to an example of profiling. And in this, I want to suggest a, a kind of a, a broad explanation, which is that Every 
high impact human rights database in the world right now is or should be a blog. And what do I mean by a blog? Well, a blog is a, is a chunk of text, right? It's a little chunk of text. But it's not just text. It's, it's text with all kinds of cool stuff embedded in it. It may have videos embedded in it. It'll have uh, audio embedded in it. It'll have uh, photos. It'll have all kinds of other media stuffed in and commented around. The other thing a blog has is that it has comments. So a lot of times in human rights work, we have discussions with each other, which are maybe more important than the original documentation, but it happens by email or at the water cooler or in a phone call. And in that sense, it's ephemeral with respect to the rest of the information system. It's gone when we want to learn about it later. But a blog preserves a comment thread. That's invaluable. The other thing a blog does is it links. Most of what people do in blogs is comment on other blogs. And a blog links so we can use this comment, this case, to say, you know, this case is probably a, a result of that other case. Or I think this case might be the same as that other case, but from a different point of view. Or this victim is the relative of that victim. Those are all links. And that blogs lead us to that. Another thing blogs do is enable tagging and classification in a very fluid and flexible way. Not a quantitative way, because we don't know how tags are applied, whether they're applied consistently or not. But they, it does lead us to a, a, a tagging mechanism which makes sorting, searching, and reading much more effective. Now, I'm not talking about a blog that we put on WordPress that the whole world reads. I'm talking about an internal, inward-focused, uh, access-controlled information system. I want us to think about what a blog does for people rather than you know, a blog out to the world. And in particular, the most important thing a blog does for people is that it makes them enjoy using it. Okay? For any of you who've built databases that have the old logic of rows and columns, even if it's a very complex relational structure, it fundamentally has a kind of spreadsheet logic where the user has to hit tab or mouse over to the field that she wants to fill in. How, how much did your users enjoy using that? Right, they hated it. They hated it with a passion. And they did everything they could to evade using that thing. It was always their last priority, which means the data was crappy. That's the reality. The data was crappy. Okay? And I, have been build I built those databases for many, many years. In fact, I wrote a book on building those databases called Who Did What to Whom, published in 1996. People hate them. So the cool thing about blogs is that people like them. People will create information in a blog structure willingly, with passion. They will make a big effort to do a nice job. That turns out to make the data a lot better. So useful things to observe. So let's look at one of these blog-like systems. And this is the profiling system in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And I'll talk about this particular example in a moment, but let me tell you about what we're doing there. Um, so conflict in the Congo has been going on a long time, since the early 90s. and during that time, a lot of people have done a lot of bad things, really bad things. So now uh, the world is really trying to help Congo get back on its feet. And much of the world, uh, Canada and the United States leading among them, believe that the most functional part of the Congolese state is the military. And so one of the ways to try to put Congo back on the road to recovery is by strengthening and reforming the military so that they can maintain order internally and bring some stability to the lives of ordinary Congolese. So far, so good. Problem? Many of the people in the Congolese military are the people who did the really bad things. Okay? There are a lot of Congolese military officers who are war criminals. So the UN Security Council uh, in the transformation of the mandate in 2010, said to the UN mission in Congo, right, we're going to give all kinds of assistance to the Congolese military, but it can't go to war criminals. No assistance to people against whom there are credible accusations of war crimes. The US has a, an aid provision, a similar aid provision called the Lehi Amendment, which has very similar requirements. And many other countries around the world, including the Euro European countries and uh, the Canadians, are implementing this at a, at a, at a regulations and practice level rather than statutorily although some are also doing it in statutes. Everybody wants to do this now. And basically, we call this the no goodies for war criminals rule. Who are the war criminals? Oh, geez. Uh, this is going to be hard, because there are 145,000 people in the Congolese security forces. That's a lot. 
And if you ask anyone who's been studying Congo for a while who the war criminals are, they'll give you a list and they'll tick off 20, 30, maybe 40. 20, 30, 40 out of 145,000? We need to do better than that. The UN has a tremendous amount of information about what's been going on in the Congo over the last uh, 15, 18 years. And it exists largely as Word documents. Which is not very useful. Uh, there are also hundreds of thousands of emails, PowerPoint presentations, PDFs of scanned, image, of scanned documents, and so forth. Documents of every imaginable format and tangled, convoluted, and weakly password protected, you know, Oh, that's safe. It's okay. It's, it's totally secure. It's, got, it's access, but it's got a password. <laughs> um, right. So we aggregated all these things into a giant puddle, a giant pot, and built a database that allows users to search through that and essentially create blogs. Now, these are very carefully vetted users and people, it's a very small team and only a small number of people are able to do this because those documents are very, very confidential. They include the names of the many witnesses and victims who've given information to the UN as well as to confidential intelligence sources that would be really embarrassing to the UN if the UN divulged. So it's really important to the UN that we have a way to talk about what people have done substantiating it adequately without revealing the source material. So we need a firewall. Okay? So what we do is we build this blog-like mechanism where we create an entry on a person with some basic information about that, the personal information about that person, but then also a series of documents which tell us things about that person. And what the documents do is we search on them. We have a somewhat intelligent, not hugely intelligent, but a somewhat intelligent searching mechanism. Oh, right, and the guy who wrote this, Waterloo, just saying. It's a Waterloo grad uh, some years ago, but uh, Canadian engineer, really, really great guy. Um, somewhat intelligent system does some searching for us, uh, gives us a view into the documents that are relevant, does a little bit of relevance ranking as we go along. There's a little bit of machine learning so that we figure out what analysts think relevance means. Uh, not a lot, but you know, we wrote it in .NET, uh, very much you know, uh, trying to swim with your one hand tied to the other ankle. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there it is. Um, that's the UN's rules. We played nice. Uh, so we get a list of documents. We can then go through them, find information that's relevant, and then tell a little story about it. We write a summary that is then substantiated by the underlying documents. And that tells us, for example, that's a story about uh, Mr. Numbi's uh, involvement in the murder of Floribert Chibaya, uh, who was a, a leading human rights activist in Congo and was murdered in July of 2010 while he was in Mr. Numbi's office. Sometimes these things are subtler, sometimes they're very obvious. But nonetheless, uh, this is a way of collecting uh, that information in a way that allows us to substantiate it, substantiate it, and more importantly, to print it. Now, this is still the UN, so everything has to come out in Microsoft Word. So you create a document, which you can give to the senior uh, officials at the mission, and they can then distribute that document to the Ministry of Defense, of uh, the Congolese Ministry of Defense, to say, this guy's got to go. We cannot give assistance to this branch of the military until this person is removed from authority because of the following allegations that we believe to be credible. Now, this is not a legal process. We are not suggesting prosecution. Uh, this is, and so the standard of proof is much lower than it would be in a criminal process. Uh, and in fact, we invite a due process in which there is a, a denial of these allegations. So far, in the uh, several dozen presentations of these profiles, the Ministry of Defense has chosen to rebut none of them. So, uh, we have not had a chance to exercise that opportunity. The structure also maps relationships among people because that's a key way to understand uh, how people have moved through their career. So we map and link all the people that someone is related to and we keep track of all their career positions, when they held jobs, where that job was held, what unit it was, what the relationship was of that unit to all the other units we know about and so forth. And all of that, of course, is time bound and dynamic through time. And the advantage there is that we can map all this information and then do a little bit of data mining on it to stimulate additional judgment. Every piece of this system is about reading faster. No one can read the many, many hundreds of thousands of documents that we have, in, have collected. No human being can read that and assimilate them. So what this information system is all about is facilitating faster reading and then aggregating the judgments of all the analysts who are participating in this as they hold this job and then get a job in a much easier posting someplace else, which happens all the time because it's really, really hard posting. Um, we don't forget what they've learned. We continue to learn and build on what's been learned. 
And I think that is a key role that technology can play. So let me give you a couple other roles that I think technology can play. Technology, of course, helps us with security at every level. And this is a general, this is one of those rare situations in which building a tool does leverage into generality. So Martis, the project that my, uh, my organization produces, of course, uh, Tor, uh, off the record, secure messaging, Guardian, secure cell phone use. These are all very, very valuable underlying pieces of infrastructure for the human rights community, building security at different levels. There's a lot of new projects. Many of them worry me. Um, the reason I want to flag these is that I think they've been done really carefully with a lot of review. And one of the things that I would urge if you're thinking of building a security project is how do you know if you've made a mistake? You need to have a really rigorous answer to that question before you suggest that human rights people put their lives at risk by using it. Um, I have very strong feelings about that and I've written about it recently and if people are interested I'll send you a link. Um, there's a couple other projects at the UN mission in Congo. Uh, others that are even more blog-like. In particular, we have a mission-wide, much lower security blog about everything we're observing. So if we want to ask the question now, hey, what does the UN know about sexual violence in Bukavu in August? We have a way to answer that that crosses the entire mission and indeed several of the other agencies uh, without having to make 45 phone calls, which is how it was done until fairly recently. We have a way of bringing that information together in a way that protects the underlying secure and confidential information, but nonetheless exposes the information that an authorized analyst needs to draw these, what we sometimes think of as, as horizontal analyses, uh, analyses that cross human rights, civil affairs, military observers, and so forth, all the different parts of the mission. We've also done a lot of work that is like the work I showed in Guatemala about document flow in Chad, uh, showing that uh, former President Hashan Habre had control of the secret police, the DDS. That's really important uh, because uh, he has denied having responsibility for the atrocities that the DDS committed. And he may yet be prosecuted in Senegal where he's been under uh, house arrest since he went into exile almost 20 years ago. Uh, we also did a profiling project in El Salvador back in the early 90s. But I want to just flag that all of these projects have this underlying notion that we're enabling human judgment. We're making it easier for people to read things and make decisions. And that, I believe, is the key. Yes. Done. Thank you, Ian. Um, we got to get it right. If we get it right, we win cases and bad people go to jail. These are the guys who disappeared, Mr. Garcia. These are the individual officers. And they were convicted, spent, sent to jail for the rest of their lives. You remember the little girl in that photo, little infant girl? Yeah, well, she's a grown-up lawyer now, okay? And this is her grandmother celebrating the conviction of their father's murderers, uh, her father's murderers, uh, her son's murderers. We got to get it right. In human rights, we have very, very little room for uh, getting it wrong because if we get it wrong, we don't just lose our own credibility. We weaken the credibility of the people whose stories we told. And it's really our obligation to protect and assist them, not to make them look foolish. So I, I urge you to join me. Let's build better tech. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, the question is, if you find an archive with 80 million pages of paper which were manually typed or handwritten, how do you digitalize it? What does that mean to digitalize it? It means several different things. Uh, first, it means to scan them and preserve the images. And indeed, about 14 million images of the approximately 80 million pages of paper that are uh, in the archive in Guatemala are now online from the University of Texas. You can go to the University of Texas webpage and look at images from the, from the police archive. I think that's really cool. Uh, so props to UT for having devoted a lot of resources because it's an awful lot of disk space and a lot of bandwidth to do that. Um, so that's one thing it means. Another thing it means is an awful lot of archival analysis. So there's the collation of collections of documents and analysis about them. So there's this sort of very basic fundamental historical work of interpreting documents. So that's the second layer. A third layer, which is the layer that my colleagues and I have participated in, is randomly sampling from the whole universe of documents and coding elements out of them, which is very much a manual process. But by doing a relatively small number of documents, 15,000, uh, a bit more than that actually, but approximately 15,000, we can characterize the entire archive at a statistical level. So there's several different approaches that lead to different, different kinds of, of value.
the, the question is, how can you use this, the rigorous statistical work to inform the qualitative work and vice versa? First thing is that the statistical work produces answers that are so precise as to be almost meaningless without context. So it's really, really important to put uh, good statistical work in a broader kind of qualitative framework in order to understand what it really means. So there's the integration that goes that way. You know, take the statistic and embed it in a larger argument that uses other kinds of, of knowledge. But going the other way, can you use statistical evidence to direct investigative resources? Yes, and we're starting to get more energy around doing that uh, recently. So I'm not supposed to talk much about that project, but soon, follow my webpage. By December, there will be all kinds of cool stuff up there. Okay. The question is, to what extent is the kind of work that I'm suggesting here being validated by peer review, by academic processes? Uh, not enough is the answer. Uh, stuff that fits disciplinary models gets peer reviewed pretty well, and largely that tends to be epidemiological. So the epidemiologists, they get plenty of peer review because if you, do an if you do an epidemiological study of sexual violence in the Central African Republic, it fits exactly the model of somebody studying HIV in New Haven. It just, and so you can publish it in the same journal. You know, and, and the same journal will be like, right on, this is exactly what we do. We're happy. But if you do this other kind of stuff, well, it's not exactly demography, although it's like demography. The demographers will say, that's not really demography. It doesn't fit in our journals. It's not mathematical statistics. It's too applied. It's not agriculture, so it doesn't fit in the applied stats. It, it doesn't really fit in any place. So for the peer review, we depend a lot on uh, little committees we put together ad hoc of primarily mathematical statisticians and demographers who review the work and give us internal feedback. That's not as good as anonymous peer review, but because there aren't journals that do this kind of thing, it's really, we've had a really hard time figuring out where to put it. Um, so that's a big challenge for us. When we get a theoretical breakthrough, we can publish it, and we do. So we have a piece uh, about a year and a half ago in a journal, a Berkeley e-journal called Statistics Policy and Politics, uh, which, was a, which is a little more fluid because the e-journals are getting a little bit less rigid than some of the old print journals were, uh, and it's because we had a theoretical piece. We, we actually created a little bit of additional math um, for that, so, but those are rare. It's hard. Challenge, love to have more. We do a lot of presenting at conferences. Questions? One more question. There's one in the back, or? Okay. Sure, go, ahead. go ahead, sure. Um, if social visibility leads to statistical reliability, have you seen any standards by organizations as far as social visibility gaining that right now across the ground? No, no, let me undo your question. Social visibility determines statistical visibility. It does not lead to statistical validity. Let's unpack that. In fact, the variation in social visibility leads to distortions in the statistics. It leads to bad statistics. So the only answer to that, to the problem of visibility, is either modeling for the visibility itself to uncover where we don't know something, OK? or to transform the problem and select respondents randomly from the population so that everyone in the population has an equal or at least a known probability of being selected for the, for the interview or the discussion. So social visibility is a, is a, is a, is a problem to be solved. It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a benefit along the way toward validity. Have you seen any templates used by organizations like that? Not at all. Um, what we have is we have disciplinary approaches. So we have the way epidemiologists solve this problem, which I think is very interesting. We have the way survey statisticians solve this problem. That's also very interesting. We have the way demographers solve this problem. That's also interesting, although you know, they all have their pluses and minuses. Uh, there's a mathematical statistical approach, a more theoretical approach, which is the one my team usually uses. But they're more disciplinarily founded than they are uh, template or, or NGO founded. And none of, the none of the big NGOs or the big human rights projects have adopted rigorous statistical techniques uh, sort of as practice yet. And I think it's really problematic. That's kind of why I'm out here giving talks like this, because I'm worried that the, w the statistical techniques that groups are adopting are very, are, are misleading, are profoundly misleading. Uh, and I won't put too fine a point on it. I think crowdsourcing is the big problem we're all facing right now. We're all intoxicated by it. It looks really cool. It produces really distorted data. It produces terrific microdata. I'm really excited by every individual story. But when you aggregate it into a statistical picture, it's as problematic as any of the others and maybe worse. So. Okay, let's thank uh <laughs>